I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Jonah. The third chapter is where we're going to start. I'm going to read in your hearing Jonah chapter 3, starting at verse 10. The Bible says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Jonah 4.1 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah then says, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Verse 4 is critical. It says, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Doest thou well to be angry? Our sermon this Sabbath, Jonah, the reluctant witness, part 4, the trouble with angry saints. The trouble with angry saints. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together in this place, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Lord, I ask that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. And upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you would just hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Father God, let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard today. Instead, Lord, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To recap again, this is the running prophet. Jonah had tried to get as far away from where God was calling him to go as possible. He thought he could get to the other side of the then known world and escape what God wanted him to do. Of course, he knew that this was a wicked city. And Nahum 1 and verse 3 describes the condition of Nineveh. It says, uh, woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Nahum 1.19 says, For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? The reputation of Nineveh was of a city that was so wicked and so terrible that people would go there and be robbed and killed. Crime and violence was the order of the day in Nineveh. So in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 3, we, 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 you would remember that we read these verses. So Jonah arose, he went to Nineveh finally, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. And it says, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried, and he said, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He went into the city, and he began to preach, and as he began to preach, the people responded. Now notice, there's not a whole lot of mercy or grace in Jonah's sermon. Jonah's just tells them the consequences. He doesn't, at least the scripture does not record the fact that there were supposed to be options for the people. But the people figure out that this is a merciful God. And in Jonah 3, 9, they ask, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And verse 10, as we just read, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and the Bible says and he did it not. Now what I want you to get is at this point Jonah decides to remove himself from the city once his preaching uh, crusade is, uh, is finished. After his time for preaching is done, he, he removes himself from the city and, and, and he is literally waiting to see that after 40 days, what is going to happen to the people of Nineveh? He's curious as to how God is going to respond after promising, uh, in a sense, through the preaching of Jonah that the city would be destroyed. When Jonah looks up after 40 days and doesn't see fire and brimstone falling from heaven 
When he doesn't feel the ground move and an earthquake open up and swallow Nineveh, when no great tidal wave of flood washes the city away, when nothing happens to destroy the city of Nineveh, the Bible records Jonah 4 and verse 1. In fact, the scripture says this, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Now, this is not your average evangelist, Jonah. Most people preach and they, they're happy to see that someone responds to their preaching. Jonah's just the, the opposite of that. Jonah, in fact, has preached a message hoping that God's wrath would be all that would come from the message. A lot of Christians are like that today. We are bent on the simply the destructive aspect of God. We, we're hoping that God wipes out folk and that God would do away with people. Uh, uh, some of them we know quite well. The Bible says, in fact, that, that he was very angry. And this word angry, Korah, is the Hebrew word, the same Hebrew word used in Genesis when, when, when uh, Cain and Abel get into their spat. And Cain is wrought with God and wrought with his brother. The word wrought there is another translation of the word. It is the same word. It is a word that does not come with just the denotative meaning of being angry. It comes with the connotative meaning of a selfish anger. Anger. Why was Jonah so angry? Well, one reason, of course, is this guy's a prophet. And kind of like, uh, you know, watching sports, I, I was talking to the city clerk this week for Pasadena, and he, he's big into the fantasy football stuff. So he's got like this rap sheet, and he keeps track of how many yards his players get and how many touchdowns they score and all of this kind of stuff. And so, you know, he wants good, you want good statistics if you play in the NFL. You want to be able to brag. In fact, in the NFL, that's how you get bigger bonuses and more money. You, you have their milestones. You have to make so many tackles if you're a linebacker or sack the quarterback so many times if you're on the defensive line. All of these things make you more money. I get the feeling that Jonah was kind of like a professional athlete. He's kind of like a professional prophet. And what he didn't want to have happen is that it be chalked up that he was a false prophet because he prophesied the destruction of a city and it never happened. You know, it's a dangerous thing when being right is more, impor more important than people are. The second reason he might have been angry is he had just witnessed the salvation of his worst enemies. These Ninevites, these Assyrians had been pummeling his country for generations. He, he was tired of them. In fact, he had hoped probably to go back to Israel and brag, listen, because of my preaching, our enemies are destroyed. He had hoped that salvation would not come to his enemies. And the third reason, as I studied all the different commentaries and everything people said that I thought was worth mentioning, is that Jonah actually feared that the Ninevites would be viewed as equal with God's people. Jonah, in essence, because of the clashes that had happened between uh, Israel and, and the Assyrians and, and Jerusalem and Nineveh, literally had become prejudiced. He didn't like them simply because of who they are. And the idea that they would be viewed on par with the people he thought were God's people was something he could not stand to think about. So Jonah goes into a little bit of a tirade. In Jonah 4 and verse 2, the Bible says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? Again, he wants to be right. Even in the face of Almighty God, his, his, his problem is, I was right. When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a great... Again, he knew. This is a, it's a dangerous place to be when you think you're the only one that has the answers. 
I knew thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. He says in verse 3, he's so, he's so angry that he says in verse 3, therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, I beg you, Lord, take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. I don't want to go back to Israel and tell them that because I preached, our enemies are alive. This, remember, this is a running prophet. He doesn't like conflict. He doesn't like to stand up and tell people face to face, I have a problem, that this is the situation. He would rather run from the problem than deal with it head on. So you find him outside of Nineveh sitting, waiting for them to be destroyed, and then he gets into an argument with God. Interesting that he would challenge God, but is afraid to actually face people. God asks him an important question. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? Doest thou well to be angry. There's two ways that that's translated. One of them is, Jonah, do you have a right to be angry? You see, Jonah, you seem to forget that just a little while earlier, you were, you were a whale food. You forget that just a little while earlier, Jonah, you were on a ship and because of you, almost everyone on that ship almost lost their lives. Jonah, you don't have a right to be angry because you forget that when I gave you a direct command, you ran in the opposite direction. How do you have a right to be angry with me? But God asks a separate question in that question. Does it do you any good to be angry? What does anger actually do to you? What happens when you're angry at people, seething, upset and the person isn't even in front of you what does it do to you to just hold anger and just be mad at folk without limit bounds or end well I can tell you from a medical standpoint as a physician that we are beginning to understand from a pathophysiological standpoint the consequences of holding anger in Holding anger in raises your emotional um, stress levels. It, it actually begins to uh, impact you internally. We have now come with a, a term that Bruce McEwen uh, from here in California, a PhD, has coined allostatic load, which is a play on the term allostasis, which is really a development from homeostasis, which many of you would remember from high school biology. Allostasis says that when it's time for you to run up a flight of stairs or run across a parking lot, your body adapts, your blood vessels dilate where they're supposed to dilate to let blood go to your muscles, your pupils dilate so that you can see, so that you can run, your heart rate goes up, your respiratory rate goes up. When you're done running, you stop. Allostatic load or allostatic overload says that when you uh, are stressed so much, so continually, so often, what happens is your blood pressure is always up. Hormones like cortisol and, and, and adrenaline are always elevated in your body, that, which leads to the increased release of things like C-reactive protein and other proteins and complexes that we now know actually destroy your physical body based on what your mind is going through. We can literally draw your blood now, swab your, your, the inside of your mouth and test for things like cortisol and understand that in fact when you hold anger in, when you have bitterness always on you, one of the things that it does is that from a physiological or pathophysiological standpoint, it literally begins to put you into what is now called a pro-inflammatory state. Meaning that you live your life prone to getting your body destroyed as your blood vessels get nicked and chipped, cholesterol plaques are easier to form, meaning that heart attacks and strokes are easier to have. God asks Jonah a question that each of us has to ask ourselves, does it do you any good to be angry? What benefit is there for you to walk around mad at folk all the time? It does you no good. In fact, it damages you. But it doesn't just damage you. Ephesians 4, verse 25 to 27 says it like this. 
Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Verse 26 says, be ye angry, but sin not. In fact, let me say it the right way. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to who? Do you know that if you hold in anger and you don't deal with it, it becomes sin, number one. Number two, when you hold in this anger, when you don't speak truth with your neighbor, when you don't treat your, 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 your neighbor as one of you, when, when this stuff starts to seethe and it sits there, verse 27 lets you into a strong spiritual secret, one from the annals of spiritual warfare. In fact, what Paul is telling the Ephesians is when the house of God, the body of Christ, his church especially, begins to function like this, you give place to the devil. That when God's house is a divided house, when there are rifts, when people don't get along, when this begins to happen here in the church or at your home among your own family, when this happens, you give the devil an opening and an opportunity to walk in and set up shop. I'll never forget my, one of my favorite classes, at, my favorite class at Oakwood was Dynamics of Christian Living taught by Elder E.E. E. Cleveland. Great class. And the reason it was a great class was it was like a church service every time you went. He didn't really teach. He preached every class. He even had an amen section in the class. <laughs> he had deacons too, actually. <laughs> and he would go through all of these great stories. And anybody who knows him knows he's got them by the bucket loads or had them by the bucket loads. One of the stories he told us, and it was confirmed later on by, my, by one of my pastors in Miami, David P.A. Some of you may know down in Miami or down in Florida now. And even uh, Rhonda Nelson and Lori Nelson's uncle, who was a pastor here on the West Coast, but was at Southern University at the time in Tennessee. And E.E. Cleveland, the Elder Ward referred to it as well, talked about a church in Nashville, Tennessee, where the people had gotten to the point where the church people were fighting so much, there was such division in the church that literally people had begun to become demon-possessed. E.E. Cleveland tells the story. In fact, E.E. Cleveland says that when he walked into the church for the first time, and, and he could exaggerate, so I'm just going to tell you what he said, but he said when he walked into the church, the pews were floating in the air. And when they began to deal with the members who had become possessed by demons, and as they began to cast them out, and Elder Ward said the same thing, and they asked them, how do you have a right to possess people who claim to know God and, or, and who are uh, supposed to be commandment-keeping people? The demon's response every time was, they have ought with their brother. The church is divided. They don't get along. The scripture tells you right here, if this is the case, if, if, if we can't work together in unity, if we can't get along, verse 27 makes it clear that somehow we give place to the devil. Satan himself is allowed to walk into your home, into your living room. And he's able to set up shop. Anger turns into sin, number one, when it is selfishly motivated. Like Cain, like Jonah. James 1.20, for the anger, and this is the New American Standard Bible says, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. It becomes sin when God's goal is distorted. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Do all to the glory of God. Anger, when it disrupts your ability to do all to the glory of God, becomes sin. The third thing is when anger is allowed to linger. And we read that verse. We read where you're not supposed to let the sun go down on your anger. In fact, as one author says, instead of using the energy generated by anger to attack the problem at hand, it is the person who is often attacked. I've been going through some, at the health department, we've been using a, an expert to come in and, and help us with working through problems and different things. And, 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 and she said something powerful as she listened to us have a discussion about something. She said, you see, when you guys have a discussion, 
You're discussing each other with your emotions. She says, in fact, what you never get around to is the actual problem. So what happens is instead of having a constructive conversation and, and developing a solution, instead what happens is you only feed the problem more because you're so busy trying to be right, so busy trying to prove the other person wrong, so busy trying to hurt the other person that in fact the problem, like a hungry lion, is simply being fed and getting stronger. When something happens and we need to galvanize around it, we must remember that we galvanize to solve the problem. We don't galvanize to attack each other. To use a sports analogy, it must be a frustrating thing to be a quarterback and throw an interception. That must be so frustrating. But if the team comes back to the huddle and says, you know what, you keep throwing those interceptions, we're not going to block for you. You, you, you know, you fumble again and, and we, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna let them hit you. You might get him, but you lose the game. And I'm learning that perfection, as we understand it, is, is, is often misrepresented. The fact of the matter is Michael Jordan won six championships. He was 6-0 oh in championship series in the NBA. But he didn't go undefeated in games in championship series. You see, he lost games, but he won championships. Some of us get caught up in the fact that we lost a game and don't realize we're in a series. Yeah. There's more to win. There's more to do. We might get set back. Terrible things might even happen, but that doesn't mean you stop trusting God. Yeah. In fact, it means you rally together and you trust God more. In fact, goes on and says, Ephesians 4, 15 to 19 says, we are to speak the truth in love and use our words to build others up. Not allow rotten or destructive words to pour from our lips. Unfortunately, this is the poisonous, this poisonous speech is a common characteristic of fallen man. In fact, the scripture says like this, when one of our brothers or sisters has fallen, guess what we're supposed to do? Those that are spiritual, yes, those that are strong, should go to that one and do what? Lift them up. It is, a, it is an evil thing to do that when someone is down, then you kick them. I don't believe God looks kindly on someone who does that. In fact, I want to read Romans 3. I want to read some of these verses. I think they're powerful. Romans 3.13, talking about being an angry saint. It says, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 15 puzzled me as I read this this week. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And I said, well, people aren't killing each other, Lord. But I want to tell you the worst wound that can be inflicted are character assaults. It's almost easier to get past someone physically harming you than for someone to harm you in a way that your very character itself is injured. Remember that the only thing you get to take with you to heaven is your character. So we have to be very careful as Christians that we, we, we think 10 times before we speak a word that might harm someone on the level of their character. That means we have to be willing to let people make mistakes and try and guide them in the way they go rather than jumping all over them to say, I told you so. Paul says there is no fear of God before their eyes. In fact, anger becomes sin when it is allowed to boil over without restraint, resulting in a scenario in which hurt is multiplied. 
leaving the devastation in its wake. Watch the last line here. Often with irreparable consequences. Did you know that folk can get so upset at each other that you almost can never heal the wound? That you can actually get so mad at someone, so, so hurt, so, so wrapped up in the disagreement that in fact the consequences become irreparable. That generations hold on to it. Have you ever seen the special on the History Channel of the Hatfields and McCoys? After a while, folks start fighting, don't even know what they're fighting about. They can't even remember that original incident. We just don't like each other. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it, keepeth it in till afterwards. A fool says everything that comes to his mind. And this is a function of, the, of your frontal lobe of your brain, the most important part of your brain. The human brain is 33% frontal lobe. The next smartest animal, the porpoise or the chimpanzee's frontal lobe is only about 13% of their brain. A dog's only about 7%. So dogs aren't as smart as other animals and clearly not as smart as some of us, even though, you know, you check some of their dogs and the dog seems to have a lot of sense sometimes than people. But the frontal lobe of your brain is very sensitive to alcohol, marijuana, drugs. If, when you destroy brain cells and it comes out of your frontal lobe, bad lifestyle, it removes the ability for you to think critically and, and reasonably. Isaiah 1 and 18 is a call to the frontal lobe. Come let us reason together. When you uh, allow yourself, and, and this is one of the remnants, and, I, and I, you know, we, we run a substance abuse uh, program at the health department, and one of the things you find is that one of the things that can often be worn away in years of drinking and drugging is there's, that there's, there's less of a filter so that whatever comes to mind is said. Well, some of us don't have that excuse. Real Christianity is careful. It's patient. It would rather be injured than to injure. Real Christianity will take the lower seat. It will be beaten up before it hits anyone. Real Christianity, uh, its strength is not in its ability to take someone down. Real Christianity's strength is in allowing oneself to be taken down so that someone else can be taken up. Anger also becomes sin when the angry one refuses to be pacified, holds a grudge or keeps it all inside. This can cause depression and irritability over little things, often things unrelated to the underlying problem. Verse 5 shows you what happens to people who are angry about one thing and don't deal with it. Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, the side where the sun would come up. And I think he wanted to be on that side, so as soon as the sun came up, he would be there to see if the, if the, if the, if the fire and the brimstone began to fall. I think he wanted to be ready to see it all happen as soon as the sun came up. And, and, and there made him a booth. So he goes to the east side of the city. He builds himself a little structure. So, I mean, he's, it's almost like this guy went and get a, to get a lazy chair and some popcorn and a, and a soda. He set himself up to watch the fireworks. He builds a booth, ready and waiting for the city to be destroyed. Clearly, he doesn't believe the city's going to survive, or he's hoping it won't because he left the city. And he sets up, he builds a booth. How many of us have built booths waiting to see the destruction of someone else? How many of us have booths set up? And you know what's ironic? I was, I was going to put in all these great quotes from Martin Luther King because he has some great quotes on this. But, but let me just say it kind of in the, in the spirit of what he said. The fact of the matter is when we are waiting for the destruction of someone else, it is us who is destroyed. While you're waiting for that ex whatever to go down in flames, it's you who starts going down. When that person has moved on, and you're holding on. It's you who are destroyed. How many of us have built booths? 
and sat under it in the shadow. So he's trying to get shade, but there's not a lot out there where he is till he might see what would become of the city. He's, he's ready. I skip verse 6 and verse 6 says that God then takes a gourd, a plant, and a plant grows up around the booth. In fact, what God does at nighttime is that God allows this plant to come up and it fills in the spaces in his booth. So that now, as the night is there and he's waiting for the day to come, he's ready now. He's like, look, not only is God going to destroy him, he made me comfortable to watch him. But the next morning, besides the fact that the plant grew, God did something else. Remember, he prepared a whale. The story of Jonah is incomplete if you don't understand that he didn't just prepare a whale, he prepared a worm. The worm, in fact, is as important as the whale, but nobody says Jonah and the worm. Because the worm is where Jonah's true character gets to be shown. The worm is what sets it up so that you actually, at the end of the book, get a better idea of the man you've been reading about for four chapters. And you get the understanding that, uh, oh, it all he's been through, there's not been much growth in Jonah. He is suffering from arrested development spiritually. But God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd, that it withered. God prepared a worm. The worm hits the plant and the plant withers. Now this all happened overnight. Remember the plant really never exists during the day. And it came to pass when the sun did arise, now the sun comes up, that God prepared, again he prepared, a vehement east wind where the heat would be coming from, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah. So he was waiting for fire to fall on them. He was hoping they'd catch the heat and the burning. Right now, they're inside the city, and they're, you know, they don't have air conditioning back then, but whatever they do have, they've got it running. They got cold glasses of water, and they're drinking, ma eating mangoes and watermelon. They're just having a good time inside the city. He's outside of the city eating sand as it blows in his face and as the hot sun like we've had here recently beats down on his head. The Bible says he faints and wished in himself to die and said it is better for me to die than to live because now what he's thinking is look God gave me the plant he took it back he didn't destroy them I'm finished I'm done I give up on this life. God comes back to the question. Verse 9, And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And watch this. He didn't answer the first time. He answers the second time and he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Did you get that? So, do you have a right to be angry? He's saying yes. Does it do you any good to be angry? He's saying yes. In fact, I want to be angry to the point where it kills me. Let the anger kill me, Lord. I'll take the anger all the way to my grave rather than give it up. I'm that angry at what happened to the gourd. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored. You didn't plant a, a plant, Jonah. You didn't do nothing. You built a, a, a weak little shelter that couldn't really protect you from the sun. You didn't labor for it. You did nothing for it. You didn't make it grow. It came up in a night and perished in a night. It didn't even last through the night. Look at what God says. He says, and should not I spare Nineveh? You're upset about the plant, but shouldn't I spare the city, the great city where there are 120,000 people that don't know the truth? They don't know their right hand from their left hand? They don't know me as their God and now they've had an opportunity to do it? And also much cattle? God says, you're upset that a plant died 
and you rejoice that an entire city lived. I mean, and you're angry that an entire city lived. Something's fundamentally wrong with you, Jonah. You see, cattle have feelings. And God was trying to say, I'm the creator of the universe. It was me who created these people in Nineveh. I even made the cattle. And I understand that sparing all of them is important. And so I labored to spare them. And God in his mercy is showing us in the Old Testament, because people say the Old Testament doesn't show God's mercy. It doesn't show God's grace. The covenant is a New Testament covenant. It is not true. The mercy and grace of God is evident all throughout the Old Testament. The story of Rahab the harlot is one of my favorites. The story of Rahab the harlot, a prostitute who took in two spies and, and knew enough about God to say, look, when you come back, make sure that you take care of me and my family. Yes. And Rahab the prostitute, based on God's mercy on her in Jericho, Rahab the harlot doesn't just get saved, she becomes Jesus' great, 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 great grandmother. Sometimes we forget that God is in the business of saving people. He will allow you to pass through the storm in the sea, to live in the, be the belly of the whale. He'll allow you to be vomited up on the shore. He will do all of those things, all of the terrible things that some of us are going through in terms of loss of jobs and loss of houses and, and loss of this and loss of that. God isn't concerned with our earthly satisfaction as much as he is our eternal salvation. And sometimes we don't understand what we're going through because we don't understand like Jonah, we have not arrived yet. As we go through these things, as we go through these challenges, God is trying to show us what do you really value? Those things that have no feeling in this world, houses and cars and bank accounts, or do you value the living things? Your children, your spouse, your family, your church family, your neighborhood, your community. A few lessons as we wrap up on Jonah. The first one is, the messenger does not have to be perfect to be effective. You see, what happens to a lot of folk is when you have these big scandals, and you know, we have so many televangelists now, and sometimes I wonder if the devil doesn't set them up to become big and famous, and everybody know them, and then embroil them in some huge affair scandal, so the whole country can see it. And as soon as somebody sees that one preacher has gone down, 50,000 people leave, the, you know, a whole bunch of the people say, ah, I'm done with Christianity. People will fall. The scripture says there's none righteous. No, not one. Doesn't make the message wrong even. Remember that Judas helped work miracles. And turned around and, be, and betrayed Christ. Understand that our, 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 our hope is not in people. It's not in pastors or reverends or bishops. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. The second, Jonah was less ready for salvation than the heathens were. I'm telling you, I've seen, I saw this working at the Veterans Hospital and the addiction treatment units. In the addiction treatment unit, I can tell you that when I was there, I found that some of these, young, these men, old men and young men, who had gone into war and battle for our country and had come out on the other side with serious addiction problems were more in a place of spirituality than many of the folk I'd grown up going to church with. Because they had hit the bottom. And when you hit the bottom and you realize really what you're made of and your inability to save yourself. The problem sometimes with being Jonah and, and knowing the truth and preaching the truth is you get to a place where you start thinking you are the truth. You start to think that because I'm in this truth, I have this truth, that somehow the truth makes me better than someone else. No, the truth only makes you more responsible. It doesn't make 
make you any better. In fact, I remember growing up, I, and I, you know, we used to have those serious Sabbath school classes in, at Faith Church in Hartford and AYs, and when they would break stuff down, I would go home some nights on a Saturday night and say, Lord, I'd tell my mom, Mom, why did we have to be raised Seventh-day Adventist? <laughs> it's too much! I can't do all this stuff. I can't even think about all this stuff. Plagues happening, trumpets blowing, seals opening. My mom, it's too much. <laughs> to whom much is given, yes, sir. much is required. If it makes you arrogant, the truth becomes poison. What should have saved you becomes your stumbling block. Because arrogance and pride are incompatible with Christianity. There is no such thing as, a, as an arrogant Christian. It is an oxymoron. The third lesson, even when God makes you pass through the fish, it is often not enough for a stubborn, stubborn character. Be careful that God doesn't have to have you go through a whole bunch of fishes. Try and learn the lesson the first time. Amen. Really sit back and pause sometimes. Take a few deep breaths when something bad happens. That's what I'm learning to do. Stop. We move so fast sometimes. We want to react. Sometimes just stop. What just happened? I remember I was driving in Jamaica. I was in a VW, old VW bug. I was in Jamaica for speaking for something. And the pastor that was driving me was trying to handle those roads with that bug and I was a little worried because if you, you go to Jamaica and you know some of those roads there's no rail there's just a cliff and you look over and you see the scattered remnants of those folk who thought they could make some of those turns and this brother is digging in this old VW bug I mean he is trying to fly and he tries to pass a dump truck with no space on this side I, I was so afraid I couldn't even scream. I just, I couldn't even holler. I was trying to, nothing came out. And as he goes to try and go around this thing, because the tires on a VW bug are only a little bit wider than a bicycle tire. Y'all know what I'm talking about. He goes to make a cut and the whole car just starts donutting on the, right on the air, just starts spinning. Now I'm screaming, oh! I'm just waiting, I'm just waiting to, for the flip when we start rolling down the hill. And we spin and it's as if the angels of God stop the car and hold it right on the edge of the precipice. Silence. I'm, I'm you know, I'm making sure I'm actually still here. <laughs> Am I still here? Are we st and that Jamaican pastor turned to me and said, Whoa, 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 what just happened here? <laughs> what, what, what just happened? I said, what you mean it just happened, man? You nearly killed us. What kind of question is that? Is we about to roll off a cliff? But he was wise. He didn't try to fix it right away. He stopped. We stopped. Let traffic stop. Let the world stop if it has to. Pause when things happen and learn your lesson from it. Ask God, what, am, what are you trying to teach me in this thing? Because the wise person learns every chance they get. Abraham Lincoln said, a wise, wisdom, is be, is, 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 wisdom is to be wiser today than you were yesterday. Every day God is teaching you something. And the final lesson from the story of Jonah is this one. Only one city yes, is going to last. You see, Abraham in Hebrews 11, the Bible says he was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. I have a, I have a surprise for you. To, I found that city. I haven't laid, out, I laid hold of it with my own eyes. But I've read in the book of Revelation that that city exists. And I have found out that, that God thinks so little of gold or so much of it that he paved the streets of the city with it. I, 
I found out that there's one city that's going to last and, and its walls are made of jasper, that, that inside of that city there are, there are houses and rooms set up for us, that there's a welcome table in that city. That there's a great gate on the city and that it is, it is guarded 24-7 by angelic, angelic hosts. I have found out that there is one city that is never going to be destroyed. And the truth of the matter is we must be careful that we don't wind up like Jonah on the outside of the city. We must live our entire lives because I'm telling you, I watch the news. I see the prophecies fulfilled. All those things that overwhelmed me as a child now are happening right before our eyes. And I'm telling you to lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. I don't know how you could live in this world and not see that his coming is near. And I'm pleading with you, church. I plead with you today to make that the focus of your life. Everything else changes. Your priorities are different when you come to the reality that Jesus is about to return. The way you speak to your children is different. Your hopes for them is different. I'm not worried about my kids getting an Ivy League school uh, education or full ride to college. I want them to ride on a chariot with wings of fire. Not worried about being the richest man on earth. I'm simply worried about claiming my mansion in heaven. I'm not worried about owning property and land and islands on this earth. I just want to know that I've got a little piece of land and the earth made new. Not worried about owning my own private jet. Because one day I'm going to get a pair of wings. When you understand that, you live differently. This world is a different place when you understand that it is just a temporary resting place. That we are pilgrims and we're just passing through. With every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Somebody wants to give their life to Jesus today. I don't know what you've been going through. Don't know what you've experienced. We saw the baptism today. The doors of this church are open. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. You raise your hand, I'll come and get you. Jesus is calling you. You want to give your life to him today. Just raise your hand where you are. He's calling you. Calling you out of Nineveh, out of Babylon, out from under the structure you built, out from under anger, hatred. He's calling you. That's Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit calling you. You want to give your life to him today? Just raise your hand where you are and I'll come and get you. I see that hand in the back. Praise the Lord. Is there anybody else you want to give your life to him today? Young person, older person, it doesn't matter. Now is the acceptable time. Time on earth is not going to last much longer. Jesus is coming. You want to give your life to him. Just raise your hand where you are. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm going to ask you if you raise your hand to just step up. Just step out of your seat or even just stand up if you can. Is there anybody else? I see another hand. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, young man. Praise the Lord. Is there anybody else? Is 
anybody else. I see a hand over here, but she's holding the baby. Somebody help her with that baby. I want her to come down front and get special prayer today. There's somebody else. You want to give your life to him today. Make your way down front, please. There's somebody else. Just raise your hand where you are. I'll come and get you. Praise the Lord. Somebody else, young man, young woman, it doesn't matter. You want to give your life to him today. You want to give your life to him. Call on him while he may be found. Anybody else? Anybody else? Young man, raise your hand. I'll come and get you. You want to give your life to him. Now is the acceptable time. You'll never regret coming to know Jesus. It will never happen. Raise your hand. I'll come and get you. I'll come and get you. Just raise your hand. There is one other appeal I want to make to us as a church family. This is an appeal for to ask God for healing. Yes, sir. To ask God for unity. That he will build bridges again. That the enemy, the devil, will never have a place among God's people here. You want to help in the building of those bridges, I just want to ask you to stand to your feet wherever you are. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come before you today and to study your word and to get a better understanding of your truth. Father God, let us not be like Jonah, knowing so much, having so much, having a prophet who had prophesied right his whole life and be worried about being wrong more than we are worried about other people. Lord, these two young ladies that came down front, I ask that you seal their decision. I ask that you dispatch angels that excel in wisdom and strength to be given charge over them. Put a hedge around them, Lord. Protect them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Lord, there are others who didn't come down front. There are young men who, who, who wrestled with this and, and thought about it. But Father God, give them no peace until they find peace in Jesus Christ. Then, Father God, help us to become the light that we can be, have been, and should be on this corner in the San Gabriel Valley. Lord, I don't even know all what may have happened or what may not have. It doesn't even matter, Lord. What matters is that we are soldiers in the army of God. Lord, help us all be diligent in performing our duties as soldiers, loving one another, caring for one another, and lifting one another up. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. And amen. You may be seated.